It's been about a day since I released the basement update. And, uh, okay, so it hasn't attracted quite as many players as I'd hoped, but that doesn't mean it's a bad update. It's fantastic, I love it, but there's still certain things that we can do to improve it. These are things that I've wanted to do um, the last, like, probably a couple of videos because I recorded for two hours. The point is, uh, we didn't quite get to them, and I think that these would uh, help. It's not the fourth anymore, it's the fifth. So let's see, I'm gonna uh, try to add more of a physics-based event, which is what the note refers to as the pill bottles event. I think I'll have them fly off, like, one by one, um, which is gonna be very interesting. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do that, but luckily these are all one part, courtesy of Union Operations. Uh, you can make a union of things and it'll be uh, different colors, but you better settle on whatever material you want. Um, I kinda wish that you could make a multi-material union. Um, let's get multi-material union trending on uh, Twitter and see if it catches Roblox's attention. These are all anchored, and I want to add what kind of... Mm, I'm thinking maybe vector force is what I want. Whatever the closest thing to a body force was, the thing that makes the door fly off its hinges in the first hallway. Oh, uh, that's right, they need an attachment. Everything needs an attachment these days. So now we've got vector force. Uh, I'm gonna unanchor this. Actually, I'm not. I'm gonna add a script that unanchors it after like a few seconds. Now I'm just doing this to test out the vector force. Let's try negative that and some of that. Ooh. Oh! Yes, that was definitely enough force. Where did it even go? <laughs> I don't think it's uh, on this planet anymore. Clearly that's too much, but I think that's what I'm looking for. So let's try 100 to 20, which is probably not gonna be enough now I think about it. Uh, let's try 100 to 50. What in the... That's not at all what I was looking for. I think I'm gonna add something to this. Wait, script.parent. Uh, vector force destroy. I've never used destroy, I always use remove. I don't know what the difference is. Let's see if that does anything, because I think it's basically like attaching a rocket to this. Okay, maybe a little bit too much weight. <laughs> Even 0.1 seconds, like literally a tenth of a second was too much weight. How about now? Okay, so that's, it's a step in the right direction. I'm gonna move this attachment like down here a little bit and maybe off to off to the side. I'm not really good at making physics things in my games. Ah, I say that, but as it turns out, that's actually basically what I was looking for. Basically this attachment has like a rocket thruster attached to it, which is constantly going, but the part is anchored so it won't really make any difference. The script um, unanchors the part and then very quickly removes the rocket thruster. So the rocket thruster fires just long enough to launch the part, which is cool. Thing is, I need one of these in pretty much every uh, one of these bottles. I'm gonna have it so that there's a few like triggers in this room, and if people step on them, then it has a chance of making one of those fly. Maybe even just one trigger, I don't know. Either way, the first step will be making um, copies of all this into all these. Why is the vector force like that? Also, can I just drag? Like, these arrows are visible. I really just want to just drag them, honestly. Just out of curiosity, I just want to see what happens if it, like, sends it into the shelf. Well, that's kind of cool. That's a good way to, like, have stuff slide without falling off. Very subtle, minimalist poltergeist. Um... Oh my goodness, this is going to take a while. What happens if I just rotate this attachment? Will it actually do anything? Oh, ho, 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 big brain. Oh man, okay, that's cool. So now I can just rotate the attachment and that I think by extension will rotate uh, the vector force. I never anchored this again, did I? Now I've got a much more efficient way of doing this. I'll have this one sling in uh, this direction, why not? So now all we need to do really is, uh, I'm gonna put these in a folder. Yes, for once I'm actually using folders and not groups. Uh, medicine bottles. Hello, medicine bottles, okay. I need a trigger, this will be the trigger. And I'll have a couple triggers in here do the same thing. Insert a script into this and it's going to say local bottles equals game dot work. I'm actually not gonna say game dot workspace. I'm gonna group all of the, should I? 
I'll make that a group. And I'm actually making it a model, not a folder. Right. And so instead of saying game.workspace, I'll say script.parent.parent.medicinebottles. I think that already makes an array. I don't think I need to say get children. I'll, I'll go ahead and do it anyway. I don't think I really need to, but I'm just doing it anyway, because just in case. So yeah, there's that. Now, how do I want to do that? I want to say uh, function on touched. I know this could be an anonymous function, but there's still a couple things that I want to do. Now, here's where my scripting library comes in. Uh, local human equals, hang on a second. There we go. Part dot parent find first child humanoid. Uh, if human and part dot parent dot oops. Oh, now I've messed everything up. Parent dot name is not equal to ghost. Then do this just to make sure. I don't think ghost will ever touch this, but it can't hurt to be safe. Um, so let's say for IP in pairs of the bottles thing do. So now I'm creating a loop that will iterate through the medicine bottles and select one randomly. You know what? I don't think I even need to do that. I think all I need to do actually is say bottles uh, math.random from one to the number of bottles. I'm not putting a die roll on this just yet, so it's if it doesn't happen when I touch this brick, that's when I know something's not right. Uh, vector force. Vector with both, what is it again? Direction and magnitude, which is watched Despicable Me. Me and my wife just watched Despicable Me, so yeah. I prefer to use Gru Force. Yeah, so I think I can say if force, then force.parent.anchored equals false. Wait, uh, force destroy. Okay, now, it's probably not terribly clear what this does. <laughs> Basically, we create a list of the bottles, and then whenever this part gets touched, it makes sure that a player touches it, or rather that something with a humanoid who, whose name is not Ghost touches it. And then it locates a random bottle in the list and checks if there is a vector force in it. If there is a vector force in it, that means it hasn't flown off the shelf yet. So that means the parent of the force would get unanchored, it would wait, like in the smallest denomination of time possible and then destroy the force. I sound like some kind of anti-Jedi activist or something. I really should make this smaller. It's just not efficient <laughs> with how big it is right now. It, it isn't. One thing I do want to fix before I forget, it came to my attention that there's like two of these. Oh, flip. Is there? Okay, so whenever I go into a game, it always looks like there's a second copy of this texture on this exact wall and i have no clue what's causing that but as long as there isn't i guess there's nothing i can do about it if you can't see it you can't fix it well i should use that more often oh here is the brick so why is it not working uh let me add some print statements to that script print touched oh i know what's wrong um i forgot to connect the uh function hang on script.parent.touched uh connect to on touched. There we go. Without the parentheses. There we go. Oh, that worked. So now I can just keep like traipsing all over this until I've knocked off all the bottles. <laughs> That's fun. Man, that last one's being stubborn. It's like bowling. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Okay. But it reminded me I need a cooldown and a die cast. I want this to be slightly common. Remind me again, game dot lighting, what my common die is. It is six. That's not common enough. I want this to be more common than that. I have to take into consideration that players aren't going to be visiting this room very often um, and that there's going to be a cooldown. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to name this event. Local event equals flying medicine bottle. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a bit. Local dice equals game dot lighting dot dice uh, dot standard uh, dot very common, which I think is like a one in four probability. Okay, I think this is where I want to put the die, uh, die roll. Local roll equals math dot random uh, dice dot mineral 
value to dice dot max roll value. And if the roll is equal to the dice dot target dot value, then do this uh, script dot parent dot. Actually, I don't need to say script dot parent. Script to say, I used to say script dot parent dot script, I think. <laughs> I don't, I can't remember if I ever did that or not. It sounds like I did. That sounds familiar. And that is just so pointless, but you know, I was a young, I was a little young Lua scripter. I didn't know better. Script.disabled equals true. Wait for 60 time, let's say a minute, really. That's how common I want this to be. Disabled equals false. Cooldown started for uh, event. Yeah, so I'm basically labeling and naming all my events so that I can... Yeah, see, here's an example. So it showed me the role of the event that just happened, and it showed me... It says, cooldown started for medicine storage ghost. Ah, two. Cooldown started for a flying medicine bottle. Good. And that appears to be working. Now I want to make... Uh, I might make a couple more triggers. I'll put it in kind of a odd layout. I feel like I'm putting like ships on a battleship board, but instead of trying to like figure out where they won't be hit, I'm trying to figure out where they will be. Uh, <laughs> but also might not be, it's very tricky. Um, I've learned how to uh, better optimize my game to reduce lag. You kind of have to know what causes lag. The more strain you put on a game and the more processing it has to do, the higher the chances of lag will be. Now, even something like these parts, it wouldn't you wouldn't think that one part would make all that much of a difference, and technically it doesn't, but it does add up because all of these little properties here, that's all data that the game has to process. And by micromanaging these, we can micromanage how much data the uh, game does and does not process. So I want them to not uh, have collisions. Let me select all these actually. I want them to not have collisions um, and I want them to not bother with trying to calculate how to cast a shadow. And that's basically all there is to it for these. Normally I would also disable can touch, but the difference between can collide and can touch is without can collide, you'll walk right through it. But the game will still notice that you touched it technically, even though you can walk through it. With can touch, the game won't process that. I need it to process that in order for this event to work. There's a few other ways to optimize uh, game performance as well, and we'll get to that. So we've got um, some custom meshes here. We all know that I built these in Blender, unless you're new around here, in which case that's a cool episode, you should check that out. Switch render fidelity to uh, performance. I, I feel like I actually explained this yesterday when I recorded. Basically, it means the further away you get from these, the less accurately they'll be rendered the less detailed they'll be, but you're not really gonna see these from very far away, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. Does one of my bottles fly off? I didn't miss one, did I? I thought I saw something move. <laughs> oh no, it's these. Well, I thought I fi- I fixed those, what happened to you? I 100% fixed these. I remember that. Did I not save those changes? What other changes did not get saved? Okay, well that's it's so nice hearing that ghost like growl over and over again. Okay, so that's one thing on the list done. And that's probably gonna be the longest thing on the list done, to be honest. Actually, no, revamping the um, tapping sounds thing might uh, take a while, but I wanna add some hydrogen peroxide, oops, hydrogen peroxide bottles to this room, which means I'm gonna need to go to Google. I'll open a new Firefox window. Uh, a hydrogen peroxide bottle. Yeah, it's these kind of brown looking ones here. This is gonna be quite an interesting experience because um, last time we worked in Blender, um, I did some practice rounds to um, understand fully what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. I don't have that luxury this time, so we're just gonna have to see uh, if I can figure it out as I go. And so far I'm not having a lot of faith in myself. Let me add a be bevel modifier to this. I kind of want the corners to not be so cornery. Oh yeah. Okay, so that's kind of doing it. I'm sure all the Blender experts are just laughing at me. Um, that's not quite the shape I need. <laughs> this is surprisingly difficult. Ah, what have I done? Uh, it's getting there. Yeah, I think that's actually good enough to be honest. I'm wondering what would happen if I did this. Nothing good, it doesn't have to be perfect. I can add a cylinder. There we go, I'm gonna reduce the uh, vertices on that, make it a little bit easier for Roblox to handle. I don't really like this, but it might be the closest I can get. 
Okay, well I found a different source image that looks more doable. Oh, uh, hang on a second. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. Ah. And just scale that up like that. Add a couple loop cuts there, scale those out, make it look a bit more round just cause I feel like it. I don't really need to model the cap actually um, because I've got a cap already in Roblox that will work. Question is, do I want shade smooth or shade flat? Shade smooth looks pretty good. A little trick with Blender that I've um, discovered is that if you add a loop cut to objects that are shaded smooth, it will kind of help you define it a little more. Kind of helps you determine like where you want the shadows for some reason. Right, so there we go. We got a hydrogen peroxide bottle that looks actually quite splendid. So I'll go ahead and export. Now I get to show off my trick that I uh, talked about. Here it is, scale. If I turn this down to 0.1, it will be closer. It won't be exactly, it'll be a lot closer to um, the scale that I want it to be when I import this into Roblox. Um, I'm just gonna say HP bottle. Nice little HP Lovecraft reference as well. So there's that. I'll also slap a label on it, or like just a rough looking label on it um, once I get in here. I don't wanna move it. E excuse me? What, what happened? Okay, whatever you say. Yeah, so I mean, it's still massive, even with the, the scaling that I did, but it was a lot more reasonable. I didn't have to like see the entire universe in front of me to, <laughs> to fix it. So this should be about that size, I think. And it should be that iconic brown that hydrogen peroxide bottles are, or burgundy, I guess. Burgundy with a little bit more green. Yeah, that's nice. That's that's hydrogen peroxide brown. So now what I can do is take this lid and copy that and paste it there. There we go. That looks like a hydrogen peroxide bottle if ever I've seen one. So I went to the doctor when I was a kid who diagnosed me with asthma, I think. He either diagnosed me or he just prescribed my medication for me. And I saw one of these bottles here in his office for whatever reason. And it just fascinated me. I honed in on that bottle thinking, why is that bottle brown? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Does it taste good? I didn't drink it, thank goodness, but I just wondered what it was. I knew it was probably something that would be fatal if uh, ingested, but yeah, as like this little four-year-old kid, I'm looking at this bottle and saying, mm, better not ingest that. But <laughs> either way, <laughs> what do I want my label looking like? I'll have it mostly gray. I'm gonna design the label like really big and then just scale it down. And here. Probably scale this down a little bit and make a union of that. So we've got this nice, like, asymmetrically. What is this called again? Not polygon. Parallelogram, kind of. Whatever it is, it's gonna be orange. I know, I'm aware of the difference between shapes and colors, but I promise. It's so nice that Roblox added, like, relative individual axes for axes for um, union operations. That's really helpful. I love that. And already that's exactly what I wanted, actually. So I'll make a union out of this and I'll scale it way down and just slap it right on our hydrogen peroxide bottle, scale it down even more. Oh, so tiny. Put it right there. Doesn't that look fantastic? We'll stretch it down this way a little bit, but ah, oh. ah, That is the best hydrogen peroxide bottle I've ever made. Matter of fact, it's the only hydrogen peroxide bottle I've ever made. Wow, this is a really old hydrogen peroxide bottle. That's very vintage. That that probably predates this asylum, frankly. That's that was like early 1800s. When was hydrogen peroxide invented? When or discovered? When was hydrogen peroxide invented? I got a nice portrait of the guy who invented it. Maybe I should put that up in this room too. 1818. I would have thought it was like 1860 or something like that. H2O2 is a clear colorless liquid compound of hydrogen and oxygen. It was discovered in 1818 by Lewis, that guy, as he uh, reacted barium peroxide with nitric acid. Uh, Walter White, I am not. I don't know what any of that meant, but 1818, how about that? Okay, so here's a hydrogen peroxide bottles. I am not going to be slinging these around the room. I imagine that looters would probably get to um, Morseburg um, at some point in time. Why is it not? Oh my gosh. All right, so I've spent about a good like 30 minutes on a hydrogen peroxide bottle. 
or I guess what turned out to be a few hydrogen peroxide bottles. There we go. All right, I need to uh, take a pause here and um, make a phone call. Uh, I just realized in the midst of all that, I forgot to anchor all these before I copied and pasted them and name them for that matter. Um, it's always good practice to name your models just in case you want to do something with them in uh, the future. And I don't think I really want to have them cast a shadow because even though it looks very realistic, shadows and lights and all that things, especially with future lighting mode, that is one of the biggest causes of slow performance in a game. That's one of the biggest reasons people have to turn their graphic settings down is because of the lighting. And I, a lot of developers on Roblox don't think it's worth it to use future lighting. And I am this close to agreeing with that. But the thing is, my game is a horror game. And so really emphasizing those shadows and making the lighting look realistic goes a long way to making it look more immersive, spookier, and more realistic. So long-winded way of saying lighting causes lag, but in this case, as long as I micromanage it, I think it'll be worth it. I'll go ahead and run the game and make sure that I didn't miss uh, any of these with anchoring them. Okay. Yeah, those are hydrogen peroxide bottles. I'm glad I didn't drink it when I was a kid. <laughs> All right, so there's that done. Yeah, we've got a lot to do still. 